Have you ever seen The Empire Strikes Back? I mean, it's Star Wars. Of course you have. But do you remember in the beginning when they were on the ice planet Hoth? You remember, right? The rebels were fleeing from the evil empire and set up a secret base beneath the snow and ice on Hoth. Would you believe me if I told you that Earth used to be exactly like Hoth? Well, minus the people and Tauntauns and Wampas and droids and AT-ATs and spaceships and laser weapons. Would you believe that Earth used to be an ice world just like Hoth? Nothing exposed on the surface but snow and ice? In fact, Earth was an ice planet like Hoth on multiple occasions in its history. There have been many glaciations in Earth history. Glaciations are periods of time when bodies of ice, like glaciers and sea ice, cover the Earth's surface. Glaciation is also the name of the process of ice forming and expanding on the surface of Earth. A glacier, by definition, is a dense body of ice that is constantly moving under its own weight. During glaciation, a glacier forms over many centuries where snow generally accumulates faster than it melts or sublimates. The weight of the snow and ice in the glacier causes it to move or flow downhill under the force of gravity. A glacier can move anywhere from 3 to 100 feet per day. The movement of a glacier is called basal sliding. It is caused by friction. Because glaciers are so thick and heavy, they exert a lot of downward pressure on the ground beneath them. This pressure creates friction between the ice and the ground, creating heat. This heat melts the ice and frees liquid water. This liquid water acts like a lubricant allowing for the glacier to slide over the terrain. Different layers of snow and ice in a glacier, however, move at different speeds. Generally speaking, the bottom of the glacier moves slower than the ice at the top. This movement and flow can cause a glacier to become deformed under its own weight. Glacial ice is brittle and can snap under the right conditions. Deformation creates deep cracks and fractures called crevasses. Where several crevasses intersect on a glacier, you will find a serac, a block or column of glacial ice. There are many different types of glaciers. Mountain glaciers and valley glaciers are some of the most well-known. They form in high mountainous regions between and on the sides of mountains. Ice sheets may be the most important glaciers due to their size and the amount of water they contain. Ice sheets are enormous bodies of ice and snow that occur on top of land. They are, by definition, over 50 thousand square kilometers or about 20,000 square miles in size. In some places, ice sheets extend over the ocean so that the ice floats on the water. We refer to these bodies of ice extending over the ocean from ice sheets as ice shelves. Ice shelves extend off the coast of Antarctica today and are more than half a mile in thickness in some places. Today, ice sheets are only found in Antarctica and Greenland. At its thickest, the Antarctic ice sheet is three miles thick. And problematically, these ice sheets are slowly disappearing due to rising temperatures and climate change. The melting of these ice sheets is expected to raise sea level and cause a marine transgression. 
which will cause significant flooding in coastal areas and wreak havoc on populations living along coastlines. Today, ice sheets are only found in Antarctica and Greenland. But in the past, ice sheets covered Canada, Scandinavia, and other northern areas of the northern hemisphere. Although these ice sheets disappeared when Earth's climate got warmer in the past, they left behind evidence of their existence. Some of the most obvious signs of ancient ice sheets are mountain glaciers. Think of them like islands. Ice sheets once connected all the mountain glacier islands to each other. But now, the mountain glaciers are the only remnants of ice sheets that had disappeared long ago. That said, glaciers leave evidence of their presence everywhere. You may recall that ice plays a key role in the mechanical weathering of rock, as freeze thawing causes rock to fracture and creates new clasts. Indeed, glaciers are agents of weathering and erosion. Glaciers displace and transport rocks as they grow and flow over a landscape. They affect the landscape a bit like a hoe used to till a farm. As the hoe is moved over the land, it churns up the material beneath it. In the case of glaciers, this tilling causes rocks located beneath the glacier to grind against each other and to move away from their place of origin. As they pass over an area, as they flow over it, the glaciers will pick up rocks and redeposit them. This sediment that is redeposited accumulates at the forward tip of the glacier. We call this sediment glacial till, or simply till, which is not surprising given how it forms as a result of glacial tilling. Note how the grains here are many sizes and shapes. Till is usually an unsorted sediment with class ranging in size from clays and silts to cobbles and boulders. Many of the large clasts are angular in shape. The pebble sized grains are often faceted and striated. In other words, they have long striations or scratch marks and grooves like the ones shown here produced when the glacier dragged them across other rocks. Today, we can find till in moraines. Moraines are sedimentary deposits at the ends and sides of glaciers. They consist of till. Moraines vary a lot in appearance because tills can have clasts of many different shapes and sizes. That said, moraines are often found around glacial lakes and lagoons produced by the melting of the ice. We can also find till in sedimentary rocks. Given time, till can become lithified into a sedimentary rock called tillite. It is also sometimes called diamictite. Generally, these rocks are conglomerates that contain no sedimentary structures. They are poorly sorted with large rounded grains. Glacial erosion, however, does not only produce sediment and sedimentary rock. It also produces landforms called glacial valleys. There are a number of varieties of glacial valleys. A cirque is a bowl or amphitheater shaped valley formed by glacial erosion. Cirques are generally found in mountains where there are surrounded on three sides by steep cliffs. These valleys are often filled by lakes. When a glacier forms a cirque, the movement of the ice pushes sediment down, upward, and out of the valley, carving the bowl-shaped valley. Some of the most common glacial valleys are U-shaped trough valleys, or glacial troughs. 
They get their name from their distinctive U shape, which forms as a result of ice filling them during glaciations. These valleys formed in the past when mountain glaciers moved downward into low-lying areas of mountainous regions, filling them with ice and in the process weathering and eroding rock, creating till and carving the valleys. Today, many of the U-shaped valleys are filled with water, such as lakes and ponds. Some of the best examples are the Finger Lakes located in upstate New York. There are 11 Finger Lakes, all roughly oriented from north to south, resembling long fingers of hands reaching out of Lake Ontario to the north. These glacial valleys began to form over 2 million years ago, when a large ice sheet grew over North America and its glaciers eroded away the existing terrain, carving these U-shaped valleys. So as you can see, we can study the history of glaciation on Earth by looking at the tills, tillites, moraines, and glacial valleys that exist on our planet today. These things tell us that there have been at least four or more major glaciations throughout Earth history depending on how you define them. Four or more long intervals of time where much of the surface of our planet was covered by ice. You can call these periods ice ages, if you'd like. Generally, ice ages are times when there are polar ice caps at the North and South Poles. The most recent ice age, or current ice age really, began in the Pleistocene epoch of the Quaternary period around two and a half million years ago, when the Arctic ice cap at the North Pole formed over the Arctic Ocean. This ice age continues to this day. Of course, climate change may ultimately end it. It is important to realize that ice waxes and wanes over time. This happens on Earth each year. Ice shelves around Greenland and Antarctica grow in the winter and melt in the summer. Conditions are constantly changing. Research on climate change suggests that the melting of glaciers each summer is outpacing the formation of new ice in the winter. So the ice shelves are slowly shrinking year after year after year. This waxing and waning doesn't simply occur each year. Earth's climate also varies over hundreds, thousands, and millions of years. This graph illustrates Earth's temperature over the last one million years. The vertical axis is temperature, and the horizontal axis is geologic time. As you can see, there were many warm periods and many cold periods over the last one million years. These periodic changes in temperature are the result of natural processes, such as fluctuations in Earth's orbit around the sun. Sometimes the Earth has an orbit that brings it close to the sun. Other times its orbit takes it further away. As the Earth cycles closer to the Sun, it becomes warmer. As it cycles away, it cools down and glaciers form. Naturally, ice sheets grow during time intervals when the climate is cold and they shrink when the climate is warm. This graph illustrates how the volume of global ice has changed over time. The vertical axis is the amount of ice. The horizontal axis is time. We refer to the cold time intervals when ice sheets are the largest as glacial periods and the warm time intervals when the polar ice cap is relatively small. We call those interglacial periods. 
We are now living in an interglacial period within the much larger Quaternary Ice Age. There are still polar ice caps, but these ice caps do not cover much of the Earth. The last glacial period began around 115,000 years ago and ended about 12,000 years ago. This image shows the northern hemisphere during the last glacial maximum, the last time that ice sheets were at their greatest extent, around 20,000 years ago. During this peak in glaciation, there were ice sheets two or three miles thick over Antarctica, Russia, Greenland, Europe, and North America. During this time, the large Laurentide and Cordilleran ice sheets covered much of North America, as far south as New Jersey on the East Coast, Iowa and Illinois in the Midwest, and Washington, Idaho, and Montana out west. It was several miles thick in some places. At the end of the last glacial period, these ice sheets retreated north into Canada and toward the North Pole, dropping sediment and exposing glacial valleys in the process. Now today, we only see the remnants of the ice sheets that formed during the last glacial periods. The remnants include the mountain glaciers in the Northern Hemisphere, as well as the ice sheets that survive in Greenland and Antarctica. It's easy to appreciate the Quaternary Ice Age, as we can see and feel its effects all around us. But other ice ages may have had more profound effects on the life on our planet. In the last 500 million years, there have been two other ice ages, the Late Ordovician and the Permian Ice Ages. The Late Ordovician Ice Age began around 445 million years ago, and the Permian Ice Age around 300 million years ago. During the Permian Ice Age, the supercontinent Pangaea stretched from the Northern Hemisphere all the way to the South Pole, where ice sheets developed over the continents of Africa, South America, Australia, and Antarctica located there. South America and Africa were also covered by extensive ice sheets during the late Ordovician Ice Age. Incredibly, the Ordovician Ice Age and perhaps also the Permian Ice Age caused mass extinctions of animal life. In fact, some scientists believe that they may have caused the biggest mass extinctions in Earth history. It is thought that 85% of all species on Earth went extinct during the Ordovician glaciation, and that 95% of all species went extinct after the Permian glaciation. There's still a lot we don't know about these glaciations, but the evidence suggests that they were deadly. Even so, the most spectacular and deadliest glaciations may have occurred earlier in Earth history during the Proterozoic Eon. During these glaciations, our planet was a snowball Earth. Ice sheets, ice shelves, and sea ice grew from the poles all the way down to the equator, where the ice would have been several miles thick. These glaciations would have certainly had deadly consequences. Because there was little or no ocean exposed to the atmosphere or sun, most organisms, large and small, would not have been able to acquire the resources they needed to survive. Photoautotrophs living in the ocean, like seaweed and algae, would not have been able to acquire sunlight for photosynthesis. It would have been blocked by ice in most places. Most organisms on Earth 
may have actually died. Remarkably, however, life survived somewhere and somehow on Snowball Earth. Scientists aren't sure how, but one possibility is that life became localized to hydrothermal vents where water sourced from deep in the earth could provide chemicals that organisms could use to produce food. Another possibility is that life evolved to live on top of ice sheets or within crevasses during the snowball earth. Whatever the case may be, something else truly remarkable happened. Animals originated and evolved for the first time during the second and last snowball earth ice age in the late Proterozoic. But that's a story for a different day. In the meantime, given what you know about earth history, think about Hoth a little harder next time you watch Star Wars. Try to imagine what Hoth might look like in a billion years or so. It could end up looking a lot more like Tatooine, Jakku, or any of the other countless desert planets in the Star Wars galaxy.